I am Rachel Humphrey with DEI Advisors. We are a nonprofit organization dedicated to empowering personal success in the hospitality industry. And I am delighted to welcome to the show today, Ryan Rivett, the co-founder, president, and CEO of My Place Hotels. Ryan, welcome to the show. I'm glad to be here, Rachel. Thanks for inviting me. For those who are not as familiar with Ryan and his background, you can learn more in his bio at www.deiadvisors.org or certainly on LinkedIn. But we are going to jump right into our conversation. And Ryan, we hear a lot of times that people say, I was born into the industry. And literally, in your case, you were born into the hospitality industry. Tell us a little bit about your journey to leadership and some of the pivotal moments along the way for you. Definitely born into the hospitality industry and always knew that uh, that's where I was headed. As far as what leadership was going to look like for me, I really didn't know until I started working. And uh, I didn't start in a leadership position by any means. Um, but what what I learned along the way in the first couple of years in, in working inside of hospitality indus- industry, inside of this organization that has involved my family for my entire life and and well beyond um, was that initially I learned what I didn't want to do. And so um, when you learn what you don't want to do, it it narrows your focus for you into what do you do best? And I found that um, I could, I could learn a lot and I could accomplish a lot through people and uh, that I didn't get a whole lot done on my own. So for me, what leadership developed into very early on is who I could find that complemented what I could do or that could most quickly and effectively help me get to where I wanted to be. And so, um, you know, I think that that journey through the initial stages of leadership uh, then transitioned into starting something that was completely new and um, and of course, a whole new bracket of leadership development expands from there within taking risk and, and communicating and everything else. But I think that's really, um, you know, my, my journey to leadership started with people and uh, learning what people work the best with me and what people could get the most done alongside of me. And, and, uh, and that continues to be what it is today. That's outstanding. You know, you mentioned taking risks, and it's one of the things I think of most when I think about you, because starting a new brand in this day and age is an incredible risk for anyone, regardless of background. You'd had a lot of experience in developing hotels, construction, hotel management, and all of that. Do you think by nature you're generally a risk taker? How do you evaluate risk and decide Yes, this is one I'm going to jump in both feet and others, but you say, you know what, I've kind of looked at this one and I'm going to pass. Um. I think I'm naturally inclined to explore. And, and so, you know, I want to know how something works. I want to understand what I can do with it. And, and that definitely leads to risk taking, but I, I'm not the uh, jump off the cliff and look down to see what's down there (laughs) afterwards. Uh, Definitely more of a take four or five looks off the cliff and try to figure out how far I need to, go back up to run towards it and, and, you know, how long it's going to take me to get to the bottom. So um, pretty calculated, but the, the risk taking that, that you do at the beginning of a career is totally different than, than the risk taking that you do as your career expands and develops and comes to sustainability. So when we started with, with my place, the risks that were being taken were much more individual. It was much more on me. I'm risking just what I'm, what I'm doing today. I'm risking just the funds that we're putting forward to, to, to do it, um, to develop it. I'm, I'm risking, you know, the partnerships and relationships that were closest to me in exactly what we were doing. And then as you develop and you gain staff and you gain franchisees and you gain business partners and lender relationships and the, the amount of relationships and people that are reliant on what you're doing expands, the risk becomes totally different because you begin to feel the, the, the risk that you're taking on behalf of so many other people. So transitioning from that individual risk to that more collective and organizational risk was probably the biggest challenge that I ran into, not in, not in accepting that that was the case and that it was happening, but boy, it's a, it's a big burden. It's a big weight that you sort of have to wrestle with. Um, and, and I don't know that there's ever enough calculation that gets you comfortable with it, but at the end of the day, you have to know 
I'm taking this risk on on behalf of myself and the people that are along with me because I think and I'm confident that it's the right thing to do for all of us. And and when before it was, well, I'm pretty sure it's the right thing to do for me and it probably is going to work out. So, uh, you know, it just it's so much easier. And then when you when you collect all of the people and all of the all the things that you care about, people you care about underneath it into an organization it's a it's a totally different world and so um i think uh now versus versus several years ago i take risks a little bit differently but no fewer of them and uh, certainly no smaller risks than i did than i did before um naturally inclined to explore but not necessarily uh naturally inclined to just throw caution to the wind so it's a uh, it's challenging when you start a new hotel brand and thrust yourself into an industry that's relatively small, but so, so big in so many ways that, uh, that we've had to grow into. You know, it's such an interesting perspective too. that transformation from assessing risk from almost a sole practitioner into a much bigger group, a really great way of thinking about it. I appreciate your sharing that. You mentioned, you know, when you come upon challenges and nobody at any level of leadership has gotten there without hurdles, challenges, obstacles, whatever you want to call them. What do you think is your strategy or, or how would you share with others that when faced with a setback, when faced with something that maybe didn't pan out when you took the risk, what you learned from it, how you process it and how you move on from that? Because each of us is going to face points in our career, we're like, whoa, <laughs> that was not what I intended. And sometimes that can be really debilitating for people. How do you push through those? Um, <clears throat> I think a couple of different things are consistent when, I, when I'm when i faced with obstacles on the front end of them. And um, and one is is sort of looking left, right, and center, not just at what the obstacle is, but also um, – what if I did this and what if I did that and, and what are the, what are the, what are the risks and the, and the rewards? Um, and so coming up to, coming up to something that's challenging, it's really you know, a matter of looking at any different avenue of accommodating it or overcoming it. Um, and I spend a little bit of time doing that. And I, and I've looked back on several challenges that we've come up to and, and said, and you know what? I should have just made that decision right away. I knew that I knew it was the right thing. It was where my gut was at the time, but I still needed to look and and sort of play out what <clears throat> what the different options are, or what the different scenarios, or what the different outcomes might be, depending on you know how much time and at what stage you are and and whatever you're facing. Um, but the second thing that's that's really I think consistent for me in that is engaging with people who I think may have been through the same thing before. So it's a phone call to um, a mentor or a business partner or, or an employee, depending upon what their experience is and what their background is. So it, there's never a, there's never an apprehension to engage somebody in it. Although I can say I've, I've experienced the, you know, the solution not coming as quickly because I engaged too many people when <laughs> overcoming the problem, but definitely seeking out somebody who you either perceive or know has been through something similar just adds perspective and makes it more comfortable. At the end of the day, it's all about making a decision and you don't know the outcome until it's over. And um, so collective, having collective thought and understanding on it as much as possible is really important. Um, but there's, there's something like that every day and, uh, bigger ones every week and bigger than that every month. So, um, I don't think you ever stop learning about how to deal with those. And if you ask me the same question a year from now, I might answer it differently. Well, maybe I will just do that and see how that goes. You talked about having people that you can reach out to, whether it be your team or mentors or business partners or whatnot. And what we are hearing more and more is the development of kind of this personal board of directors, this really group of trusted advisors. Do you rely on maybe a small but mighty team of people if you have challenge one, you might go here, challenge two, you might go here. And how do you identify the right people in your support system that really work for you? Um, for me, it's, it's the people that, uh, well, I'd say my closest friends are people that I work with, whether they're 
whether they're business partners that uh, invest or or run parallel businesses and we collaborate uh, on ventures or their employees. Um, there's there's no there's no real separation between my closest friendships and my closest counterparts in, in the business. And so they all come into play in different ways and in different circumstances there. My grandfather has been huge uh, in terms of a support system and definitely is often the, the phone call I make initially to say, hey, I know you've been through something like this before in 50 some years of business. So, you know, got any insights for me? Um, and, and I think beyond that, then it comes to, you know, my executive leadership team are all very close friends of mine and a few business partners. Um, and it just sort of depends on what the circumstance is and, and what I'm looking for. But I definitely, definitely thrive off of having that, that comfort that comes from somebody saying, I don't really know how to deal with that, but it sounds like you're going the right direction or, yeah, I dealt with that a long time ago and here's what happened to me. I don't know if the same thing will come from you. It, it isn't really about coming down to getting, getting an answer or getting a, a list of instructions on how to deal some deal with something. It's more about the confidence in, in moving forward and dealing with the issue that's come in front of you or dealing with a decision that you have to make that isn't necessarily an issue. Um, but is really something that you need to, to, be confident in making and, 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 uh, you know, know that there's going to be a follow up to it. That's uh, positive. You mentioned a second ago, your executive leadership team, and I've had the privilege of spending a good amount of time with your team. Um, ta and certainly my place and you personally are known for building a great team around you and developing talent. What do you look for in identifying future leaders, the people around you for a leadership team? Obviously, you mentioned there's a great responsibility in launching a new brand and being a part of this industry. What is your secret to success on that front? Um, well, part of it isn't a secret. It's just luck. Good people have come my way <laughs> more often than I can, than I can, you know, identify. Um, and, and it, it, it really is easy to see um, someone who's going to jump in the foxhole with you um, from an early from an early stage in, in getting introduced to them, I think, because uh, they, they engage, they pay attention, they're interested in hearing what what you have to say, but also get the the candor and the of the responses is something that's really important somebody who's willing to speak up um and not just interject an opinion for the sake of being part of the conversation but to actually learn something from it to actually take something away from it or to provide some input um i've had people that that uh i've had an initial interview with who i've walked away going hmm, that was a pretty good idea i should I should look at that and look at that and look at that before I ever knew that they were going to join the team. Um, and I think that's, that's a really important first step. And then not just allowing that, that quality and that attribute from the very, that you identified in the very beginning to, to go latent, to, to not be exercised. So knowing that, Hey, with this person, every time I talk to them, I should, I should engage this element of, of their personality that, that, Hey, I know he really likes to analyze all of the different circumstances that lead up to it. He's kind of a builder. He likes to he likes to kind of put the the instruction manual together while we're talking about doing something. With this person, I know they're a little bit more averse to risk. What they like to do is they like to analyze the outcomes before they before they really get to developing the list of things. And so, you know, I, I think you you start with maybe the 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 feeling that you can just have a really candid conversation with them and that they're genuinely interested in the subject that you're talking about or the team or the business that you're talking about. Um, and then from there, in order to develop it, you just have to continually engage in a manner that's specific to them or, or at least throw something into each of your interactions that engages them specifically. And I think that's what's built a great team for us is that we challenge one another a lot um, but the challenge isn't isn't 
a, a competitive thing. The challenge is really to see how much we can get done. And uh, so creative conversation comes from people that say, I'm not creative. I hear that all the time. It's like, no, you're, you're creative. I, everybody's got a level of creativity. It's how much they access that and how much the people around them access that, that, that exposes them to it and, and pulls it out. Well, and what a sign of leadership to not only be open to a diverse set of thinking or of process and other things, but being able to find a way for all of those different strategies to not just coexist, but really thrive in your environment. Um, I wanted to turn attention to one of the things that people say is their biggest hurdle to a desire to be a leader. And public speaking has a lot of components. You know, we can be talking about, are you presenting to a team, to a board, obviously to a large conference like you do. Um, I want to share one of the ways that you have impacted my career a lot. One of the ways that um, I have learned from you is that in this industry, which has personalities of all kinds, you are 100% the same person in every environment I see you. If I'm in a one-on-one -on -one meeting, if you're on the main stage at your own conference, if you're on the main stage at my conference, I know exactly who I'm getting because Ryan is authentically Ryan in all circumstances, including a lot of the public speaking. And I really love that because we might be seeing it a little more coming out of the pandemic, but oftentimes with leaders, you see one kind of more private version and then a very public version. Talk a little bit about public speaking, the role you think it's played in your leadership, maybe how you prepare, how you feel about it, and what you would tell others who really find this to be a big hurdle for them. Um, I, it's always been uh, something that is is uh, comes pretty easily to me, so long as I try to do it naturally and don't prepare very much. Uh, I, I have really stumbled all over myself in, in speaking engagements or in meetings when I've tried to prepare and go point to point and kind of have a manuscript or memorize points or talking points. Um, I just never quite feel comfortable unless I'm able to just respond with what comes to me and have a real conversation. And I think that's something that is challenging for a lot of people is to see if you're standing on a stage to see what you're saying as a conversation with the people that you're speaking to, even though they're not responding because it's a big organized event and, and it's a, you know, uh, a presentation, so to speak there, it is a conversation because if you're speaking to them about things that they care about, and those are the ones you want to talk to, they're having a conversation with themselves. They're thinking about it and processing what you're saying in your head or, or in their head. And so you get more comfortable that way when you know that people or you you understand that people are are listening to you in terms of how you speak and and how you would speak to them if you were just having a one on one conversation. Uh, it's extremely important for me. I, I just prior to this, I finished a two hour meeting with five people around my table where I, I'm going to say I did 70 percent of the talking because the more, majority of it was a presentation of a of a new objective we have. And and um, whether that's whether that's a, a lender or uh, an investor or a franchisee or a, or a group of uh, uh, association members that are in a in a general session hall at a conference, it's the same conversation either way. And, and it's just a different venue. And um, you have to be able to put a sentence together and to anticipate a response and um, uh, my kids are are my two oldest are dealing with speech class right now in high school and uh, they come to me and ask me you know how do you how, how do you do it what do you, what do you do beforehand and tell them you know everybody is completely different in how they prepare and there's no way that you can parlay hey here are my techniques into somebody else's and have it be 100 percent what they do but if you can conceptualize the people you're talking to as being there because they want to hear what you have to say and you having something to give to them, it's a little easier to talk about, whether it's a casual conversation, kind of like what we're having right now, or it's a formal presentation in order to get somebody to make a decision at the end of it. Um, I try to view them all the same. They're, one is no less important than the other. And uh, 
Um, and you need people. If you understand how much you need people in order to be successful in business, you recognize that how you communicate and how you engage with people and, and the consistency of that allows them to rely on you. And if they can rely on you, you can get a lot done together. Well, I love that you started off the advice with um, my authentic self, since I just said that's actually what comes across, at least to me, in all of my encounters with you. And I do think it's interesting because you're absolutely right about every strategy being different. Yours is to not over prepare because that may paralyze you in the moment. Mine is to over prepare because I think no one's going to be more prepared. And then I can talk about anything as long not to prepare to write out, but just to be ready for whatever comes my way. And we can both have success with incredibly different strategies behind it. The second to public speaking that we hear as one of the biggest hurdles is people who really struggle with a lot of negativity on their own, whether it is self-doubt, we hear the phrase imposter syndrome a lot, whether it's insecurities. I'm wondering if um, you have strategies that you would recommend when you might get in your own head about whether it be skills or a choice you're making or something else, and you, you get in a place where it's hard to move forward because you're dealing with a lot of negativity. Yeah, that's a difficult one. Um, you know, I deal with that a lot because um, of being a part of a generational business. There's a legacy aspect to our business here that, um, you know, there's a there's an element of of performance and pressure that comes along with having success. And I couldn't it could never be the same or or likely not better. But but uh, even just having success following a, a prior success. And so when you when you think about that and you say, well, it's self-inflicted because nobody's coming in and saying these things to me and then I'm repeating them to myself. I'm, I'm coming up with the negative self-talk and the, and the doubts that I have going into different situations or, or in looking back at what has been accomplished or not accomplished in a period of time. And um, it is a, it's a really difficult thing to, uh, to deal with, but I think, you know, what, what really helps, um, to some degree, and I'm not sure that I've figured it out much yet, but what really does help, um, is to get completely out of and disconnected from what it is that you, the negativity is coming from. If it's business, if it's, a uh, Hey, we, we laid out this objective at the beginning of the year, here we are halfway through the year and we still haven't gotten halfway to where we should be. We're way behind. And, I haven't appropriated the right people and I haven't put the right funds in and I should have spent more time and prioritized this and this and this, and I'm really not doing a good job. You can come up with all of those different negative things that just take you away from actually getting anything done. So for me, it's removing myself completely from it and not for a long time, but doing it intentionally. Let's say it's going outside for a walk or it's, or it's taking a drive for a little bit and having a different conversation with myself and saying, okay, I'm going to put this aside right now and I'm going to go, do this or it's, you know, I like, I like fishing. I like golf. I like activities like that. So if it's even, even going out to the driving range for an hour can make a big difference, but that really helps me is to, is to get away from something that's creating a challenge and some doubt for me and get into something that doesn't incorporate a challenge or any doubt. It's, it, it's just something relatively benign, but something that has some positivity to it. Um, and you obviously can't, leave for an hour every time something like that comes up. But the big ones, it's that. The small ones, it's talking to somebody who's not involved. It's maybe making a phone call or even shooting a text to somebody to say, hey, how's it going today? Or man, this this is a really big struggle for me for the moment, but uh, I want to see what you're up to. Um, it, it does definitely come down to people and, and the frequency of your ability to rely on people when you're not feeling great. It's no different than, you know, kids when they're not doing well. I'm like, you know, I, I've dealt with this and I remember it from being a teenager of all the doubt that comes along with being in high school and all the outside influences that come along with it. And I recognize it when my kids come to me and I say, Hey, um, you know, I'm just kind of bummed out today and I don't know why, you know, it's an outside influence and that negative self-talk that, the best thing you can do is change the subject and, and try to get them off of that so that you can come back around to deal with it again. And that's what I think works best for me is just 
being able to break from it for a minute or an hour, knowing that I'm going to be intentional about coming back to it and dealing with it after the fact. Well, I think that's incredible advice. I really appreciate your sharing that. Um, one of the other things that keeps you very busy is your activity with boards and associations. Community engagement, I know, is very important to you and to your family. And oftentimes we can learn incredible leadership skills through these other activities that we do in addition to what I'll call our day jobs. Um, why is that type of involvement so important for you? And can you pinpoint maybe any skills that you developed through that involvement that are different than you've developed in the corporate world? Um, I think that they're important. Be that involvement and that engagement is important for relationship building, for one. Um, but it's also it also gives you an opportunity to have input in areas of your business or in areas of of the world uh, around you that you would get so busy otherwise. Because I have you know family and work and hobbies I like to get involved in and things like that that I can fill up 125% of my day with all of those things that I want and need to do. Um, if I don't carve off some time to get involved in something that I, you know, maybe want to do, but don't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily rise to the top of the bucket of wants and don't actually need to do because I, you know, I have my business, I have my family. Those are the two primary needs. Um, it really helps you to expand pers perspective too and, and bring things back to your own business and your own success um, and to feel good that you help somebody else out. Typically there's a, there's a reason for uh, you know, being involved in these things that is not a beneficial, not just a benefit to you, but it's a greater benefit to the people that you're engaging with. And so, you know, I look at it in all those ways. I challenge, um, myself every time there's a new opportunity or a new request to get involved in something with respect to how much time do I actually have to give the, to this and am I going to be an effective part of it with the amount of time I'm willing to commit. So um, I've definitely, definitely abstained from a lot of engagements that I kind of think would have been fun or would have been enjoyable or really rewarding to engage in, but I just knew that I wouldn't have the bandwidth to be a, an effective part of it at that time. And so um, I think those things are all really important. For me, what I've developed out of working with associations and nonprofits and boards um, is patience. Things <laughs> move much less quickly in those settings than they do in our offices or, you know, in the business setting where uh, it's more of a, it's more of a transactional uh, venue and, and decisions can be made by the decision makers as opposed to often decision by committee and, and, you know, extensive conversation on it. So that's my, I know it's, it's a valuable part of, of my personality and what I've learned in business to be able to make decisions quickly and take risks and, and, uh, be impatient with inefficiencies. Um, it's not necessarily all good though. And so getting involved in things that are a little different, help you develop some patience and again, add perspective. So I, you know, it's pretty all the way around. I just have to be careful not to get myself committed to too many and, and uh, you know, not do a good job at them. So. Well, that's um, some real and in really interesting perspective on the patients too, because you're right, the speed of change can be very different in those two different environments. Um, we are going to run short on time. We have so much we could visit on. I have a couple of quick questions I want to ask you as we wrap up. One is we hear so much nowadays about developing a personal brand. People really want to know who you are. What do you stand for? Um, as you sit here today, do you have a personal mantra or, or personal brand that you feel like really drives the decisions you make in your personal life and your professional life day in and day out? Um, I don't think I've developed anything specific. I, I really, uh, you know, just kind of take life as it comes and um, have a lot of people to consider in every decision that I make and, and every role that I take. And so um, it, it's life's pretty dynamic. I haven't been able to put a, a, a brand on it. 
Well, maybe life is dynamic is your personal mantra that you take things as they come. I forget that. Uh, one of my favorite questions always to be asked and to ask back is advice to our younger selves, because I do think that personal growth and reflection are really an important part of our development as, as people, as leaders. As you sit here today, what do you tell 21-year-old Ryan, either things you wish you had known then or about how things will turn out for you today? We don't have enough time in this <laughs> to go through that list, but... Um, <laughs> You know, I think you could probably sum it up and, and consistently this comes up for me um, is don't sweat the small stuff. I mean, it really, the amount of things that I allow to roll off my shoulder today versus what I did 20 years ago um, is substantially different and, and importantly so because I'd never be able to carry all of that uh, along with what builds up over the years. So um I'd, I'd be happy to tell anybody, relax a little bit and don't sweat the small stuff. That's incredible. Sometime I'm going to have to follow up with you on how that evolution has happened, because I think that's hard for a lot of us, Yeah. Um, maybe through the drive and the other things to take things um, very personally, certainly, and with a lot of impact. And as you mentioned, you have a lot of people that rely on you too, which is that added pressure, not to mention the legacy and other things. Um, just wrapping up now, keeping in mind the motto of DEI Advisors to empower personal success. Is there any piece of final advice that you would offer to our listeners who are looking to continue to develop and grow their careers? Um, engage and allow different perspective, pursue different perspective. I mean, constantly in the, in the decision-making process, trying to look at things from a more symmetrical viewpoint as opposed to, you know, linear is extremely important. I'm trying to get better at it every day myself. Um, but I find when, when I can look back and say, Hey, I did consider multiple perspectives there and I did seek out advice. Um, I'm always more comfortable and, and happier with my decisions. Well, that's great advice and a great place for us to wrap up. Ryan, thank you so much for supporting the initiatives of DEI Advisors. Thank you for all that you do for the hospitality industry, for our relationship as well. And just really um, appreciate you sharing your thoughts with us today. Thanks for the opportunity to share. I'd love to do it again. And for those who are listening at home, we hope you will visit DEIadvisors.org to hear from the over 100 industry leaders who have shared their paths to leadership and the um, lessons they've learned along the way. You can also stream DEI Advisors on your favorite podcast streaming service. So thank you, Ryan, again. And